Namaste and welcome to Urban Chatterati. This is Abhinav Prakash. And today I'm joined by Aditya Raj Kaul, a journalist and a native of Kashmir, to discuss the recent controversy in the Tata Institute of Social Science, where paper after paper, projects after project, dissertations after dissertation are arguing for Azadi of Kashmir and calling India a colonizer in Kashmir, and even going as far as calling for balkanization of India. So Aditya, welcome to the show. Thank you, Abhinav. It's always a pleasure to interact with you. Adit, I have seen this thing for many years now when I was at JNU and also uh, out of the JNU that in the academic circle, when it comes to Jammu and Kashmir, there's just one kind of narrative which is dominant. All of the academic work, all of the PhD theses, all of the projects, whether it's a gender studies, peace and conflict studies, even the rural development studies, come up with the same propaganda that Kashmir is illegally occupied by India and the Every problem in Kashmir, even the domestic violence in Kashmir, is because of Indian occupation. Why do you think that that propaganda is so dominant, is so homogenous? There is no other point of view. One, because of our tolerance. You know, we have such tolerance levels in India that it shocks me sometimes. You know, I'm reminded just a few years back, since you mentioned JNU, slogans, India tere tukde honge, inshallah, inshallah. You remember that, Abhinav? And, uh, you know, I was one of the first, I won't say the first, but I was one of the first journalists to cover this. And a security guard, who was my source from JNU, called me frantically and said that, Sir, you have panga here. And you have these slogans, I'm going to videos. And I rushed. And, you know, at that time, I used to work in Times Now, I called Arnab and said that, you know, boss, something has happened and this is, you know, insane. So I went there, I got all the videos and next day we played it. And the rest is history, what happened. But, uh, you know, this has been tolerated for far too long. Again with JNU, I'll tell you another episode. Uh, just about a decade or so ago, my sister, who was also a journalist, uh, you know, before formally joining journalism after her, you know, studies in Delhi University, went for her higher studies in JNU. And topic of her research was post-exodus literature of Kashmiri pundits. Post-exodus literature of Kashmiri pundits. And a gentleman, I won't name him. Please name uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Please name uh, uh, So from JNU. And that person said that, you know, what is this dissertation? He almost threw the copy. No, no. If you said, name the professor, Adit, please. please. Uh, hey, I, I don't remember the exact name right now. But uh, if I do, I'll put it, I'll tweet that. Mm -hmm. So I've narrated this story on Twitter also. So uh, I'll have to call my sister in US and ask. So uh, that, that particular person said that, what is this? You know, there's no exodus of Kashmiri Pandits. When did this exodus happen? There's no formal exodus or whatever that has happened. And my sister was, you know, uh, almost in tears that this is, and she never went to JNU thereafter. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, that person said that it was Jagmohan you know, who led to the exodus of Kashmiri pundits and this has happened. Now, these theories have been propounded, not just on Kashmir, on each and every issue here in India, on politics, on social uh, issues, etc. And we have, you know, remained silent. And uh, how long will we tolerate this? I mean, there is this so-called, uh, you know, Lutin's media in New Delhi that has this firm belief that, uh, you know, uh, things can never be right in India. And they always believe in criticizing. Now, I'm a journalist. I have a right to question the government. I do question the government. But there are certain issues or certain things that are non-negotiable, uh, like security of India, like sovereignty of India, like Jammu and Kashmir, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, security or safety of any Indian. So if you compromise on that, just like somebody, you know, after this all-party meeting on Jammu and Kashmir said that, you know, see, Modi government has taken a U-turn. And see, uh, there has been a huge policy shift. <laughs> what policy shift has happened? I mean, what you turn has happened? This is a step-by-step -step reform, a step-by-step -step change. Things won't change overnight. I, as a direct victim of uh, ethnic cleansing and exodus, ha have a lot of tolerance. But I also realize that, you know, perhaps in the larger interest of the nation, uh, it will take maybe a decade or maybe more than that to bring in some semblance of peace or normalcy uh, in the Kashmir Valley, that too 
if we have this consistency of not allowing an ecosystem to continue. So just like this terror ecosystem has continued Abhinav in Kashmir, there's this ecosystem, uh, these eco chambers in New Delhi, where I also sometimes feel very, very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you very, uh, you know, honestly here, yeah, that uh, since we are not just talking about, you know, institutions uh, or universities, but also media, that I was uh, a panelist on NDTV, uh, you know, many years back, many, many years back. Uh, this is almost 15 years back. And uh, I used to come regularly, uh, you know, on Barkha's show, on Vikram Chandra's show, on Sonia's show and, you know, different debates. I was, of course, involved with some kind of activism, you know, in my student days uh, with Priyadarshni Mattu and Jessica Lal and other cases and thereafter Kashmir, etc. But, uh, you know, once I appeared on NDTV on Kashmir, NDTV realized that, you know, this person is very anti-separatist and very anti-terrorism. Was it a crime? I don't think so. But one fine day, a person from NDTV contacted me. And I'm telling you, this happened 15 years back. And said that, boss, we wanted to invite you. And we also invite, wanted to invite other prominent Kashmiri pundits and, you know, people who have been neglected, etc. I was very happy that NDTV is doing a show, bringing in voices and, you know, voiceless people together. And he said that we'll go to Kashmir and, you know, this prominent anchor will go there and cover it. I said, great. So I gave around 15, 20 names. And after that day, I never got a call from them. Mm. So a few days later, a friend who was working in the same team called me and said that, you know, uh, I wanted to share something. I said, yes. And she said that, you know, uh, somebody had contacted you with these names, etc. And you know what they did? They blacklisted you. And I said, why? Why have they blacklisted me? I mean, I didn't say anything against any person or, you know. And she said that, you know, uh, they didn't want, want a certain kind of a voice to come out. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, very uh, anti-separatist or anti-Pakistan or anti-terrorism uh, because, you know, there are separatists going to be there and, you know, etc. I got shocked. And this, and she said that it's not just you. The 15, 20 names that you gave them, they banned them also because they knew that they might have a similar kind of a thought process. Oh my God. And I was shocked. This is freedom and, of expression, right? <laughs> yes. And two or three years later, imagine a person like Vinod Mehta, you know, a prominent figure in the liberal circles in um, God bless his soul. Mm. Uh, he was banned as well. Why was he banned? Because of Radia tapes. You know, he dared to cover the Radia tapes as a cover of the Outlook magazine and the same channel ba- banned him. Because, you know, he dared to do that. Mm. So, and he mentioned this. I mean, in his book, The Lucknow Boy, Vinod Mehta, mentioned this. Now, I may have a different uh, hundred uh, arguments with Vinod Mehta or his ideology or whatever on different issues, but they banned him just because he exposed the reality. And of course, we know what happened to Radia Tapes or, you know, no action happened. So this is an ecosystem, an eco chamber. And should I uh, answer, uh, you know, what Vinod Mehta wrote in his book? And very importantly, Hmm. that, uh, you know, integrity is like virginity. You can lose it only once. (laughs) And that's what has happened to Unfortunately, you know, NDTV. Now things have changed. Those people have left NDTV. So I have no grudges with NDTV right now or, you know, what they do. But this happened 15 years ago. Uh, Vinod Mehta is not amongst us. He has mentioned this in his book. So I just wanted to mention this happened two years before Vinod Mehta to me as well. Yeah, yeah. Very important point. But, you know, when I was reading these papers in the case, and these are MA projects, right? Uh, because there are some PhD theses which are also... Uh, labeling in the, using the word like military occupation of Kashmir and all, but I haven't been able to get access to them as of yet. But you know, I was very shocked that the language they're using is exactly the same as the language of Hizbul Mujahideen, Jashay Muhammad, Jamaat Islami, and Jashay Muhammad, Hizbul Mujahideen, lashkar e taiba they're an international terror organization. They're not limited to Kashmir. Why do you think that this is happening, that Indian students not from Kashmir, from the other parts of the country, are peddling these kind of narratives. They're very adamant about it. They know what they're doing because if you look at the social media post, they are defending it. They're saying, this is what we believe, this is what we will write. And if you read those papers, if you go through the references, the people they are thanking in acknowledgement, most of them are separatist. Going by the references, someone is sitting in America organizing the ISI conference and so on on Kashmir. Do you think it's a well oil machinery, which is promoting such kind of work in Indian social science departments, taking these students to do survey in Kashmir, 
but through a particular network. Do you think that is also there? You know, Abhinav, in the year 2006 or 2007, or maybe was it 2008, I don't remember. There was a Kashmiri documentary filmmaker who made a documentary called Jashne Azadi. And this Gautam documentary... Gautam Navlaka, right? Uh, uh, no, not Gautam Navlaka. I think Sanjay Kak. Sanjay Kak. Sanjay Kak. And, Sanjay Kak. Uh, so he made this documentary and this documentary featured Jashne Karwa of Yasin Malik. Now, who is Yasin Malik? He's the chief of Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front, which was a banned organization till 2000. And after 2019, Feb, it was banned again. Yasin Malik is in jail ever since. And uh, Yasin Malik in Tim Sebastian's show on BBC Hard Talk has confessed killing uh, IAF personnel. And till now, in this democratic India, there's been no justice in that case. In for 32 years, that case is pending in the Tata court. That's a separate issue. But when this documentary was made, you know, when this was released in India Habitat Center, I, along with another friend and five of us, protested. And we protested and said that, you know, this is not showing the reality. This is a propaganda. And we'll, we are the direct victims and you should hear us. And my fear was, was that this documentary is now going to travel all across universities, all across academic circles, all across even filmmakers and others, and perhaps through digital media, YouTube, etc. Everyone is going to watch this and believe blindly the propaganda because it's a great filmmaker who has made this a friend of Arundhati Roy and Zayed Ali Shah Gilani and Yasin Malik. And this has happened. You know, within 10 years, this has happened. I remember Madhu Kishwar, uh, many, many years back in her different avatar back then, organized a program in uh, uh, in, 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 in the Nehru, uh, you know, uh, 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 yes, Teen Murti. And uh, in that library, uh, even Yasin Malik was there, uh, Abdul Ghani Bhatt was there from Huriyat. Ram Jait Malani was there and others were there. I remember Sushil Pandit was there. I was there and a couple of Kashmiri Pandits were there. We protested again. And we said, you know, what kind of an academic discussion are you holding? And when you are propagating, and Madhu Kishwar had organized that and she would remember. She was very close to Mehbuba Mufti also at, at a particular point in time. And uh, we protested at every academic event because we knew that openly this propaganda was running. And in many events, people told me that we didn't know about this 1990 terrorism. We had no Mujahideen or Lashkar Toiba. We didn't know that there was selective targeting of Kashmiri pundits that happened. Hell, we didn't even know that the exodus of Kashmiri pundit happened. So this deliberate propaganda, Abhinav, has been happening for years together. Years. It's not a new development. Now they do it even openly because they know nobody is going to challenge that. So I say that it's not just the failure of the government and failure of our system. It's also Abhinav failure of the academic community. The uh, Now, I'm not going to label them as right wing or left wing here. But as I said, that some issues cannot be compromised, just like national security and sovereignty. So how can you, you know, if one has to do a research on radicalization, go ahead. If one has to do a, you know, a research on Hizbul Mujahideen, Jaysh-e Mohammed, Lashkar Toiba, how they came up, what impact they have had on Kashmir society, great. But to peddle this fake narrative of Azadi, this fake narrative of, you know, secessionism, uh, you know, against India is, is horrific. So I think the government of India, the Honorable Education Minister, need to do something. And if this has happened in Maharashtra, where is the Maharashtra government? Where is, uh, uh, you know, Shiv Sena? Because let me remind, uh, you know, the Chief Minister of Maharashtra that it was his father who actually cared for the Kashmiri Pandits. And we respect him. And this is one thing that, you know, Kashmiri Pandit might be a right wing or a left wing or a centrist. He will always say this. Maybe a couple of uh, them won't. Don't question me later. But most of us will say this and respect Bala Thakre for uh, making, ensuring that Kashmiri Pandit community who are languishing in camps get proper education, get reservation in seats. And this reservation is not uh, by compromising seats of general category or Dalits or OBC or others. It was over and above. If there were 40, first, 40 seats, the 41st went to Kashmiri Pandit. It's still like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I firmly believe that, you know, government of India again should do an audit. If Kashmiri Pandits do not deserve reservation right now, you abolish it. 
You know, I will always say that. I have been a votary against caste-based reservation. So I will say this openly. I believe in affirmative action. Mm-hmm. But to peddle these lies, uh, you know, continuously shocking. And till the time the government does not wake up, system does not wake up. Now, individual activists on social media cannot do much. We can uh, spread awareness, etc. But the system has to react. When I tweeted some of those papers, many people, and this is the mindset of Indian society, they're too tolerant. They say, why are you doing that? How does it matter? Someone is writing something in some university. And I, and I kept telling them, you know, this this is basically creation of a literature. This will then become the reference in some other book, in some other paper, some other article. That will become reference in some other book, some other paper. And within 20 years, it will be the established truth. Just like you're saying, the documentary had an impact. But our people just don't understand these things that how narratives are created. But, you know, coming to another point, um, why do you think that a large number of uh, journalists in media, uh, in newspapers specifically, they are so sympathetic to uh, the Azadi of Kashmir and Balkanization of India. Media like Quint, Quint ran an article the wire is a hopeless case anyways, in my opinion, it's run by a foreigner, so nothing more to say. But the Quint had an article on the test issue and it's a propaganda, it's not a coverage of the issue, it's some, some lady journalist writing something and saying the people who called out this kind of work, saying they are trolls, they are threatening the students, they are trolling, they are abusive. She couldn't show any abuse or trolling, right? But she was labeling such allegations. And then it goes on to normalize the word India occupied Kashmir, saying it's not illegal. There's nothing illegal in using this word. So why do you think that a section of journalists is also on the same page as lashkar e taiba There are two things. One, uh, it is instant success. You know, They feel that a particular breed of journalists, particularly on social media, that once you abuse India, once you you know go all the way out against the government, the government will not touch you, but the international lobbies will in, you know immediately recognize the Pakistan ISI will immediately recognize you you know as an asset. Mm, yeah. uh, there will uh, there will be others who will immediately see this, and of course there will be many uh, foreign publications, particularly in the Middle East, in US and UK, who will give you uh, you know hundreds and thousands of dollars to write for them to appear on their media and abuse India. This has been happening for years. So why are we surprised? You know, this will continuously happen. And secondly, this is one. Second thing is also their ignorance, the ignorance of facts, the ignorance of reality, the ignorance of history, the ignorance of uh, realizing what has happened through Islamist terror. Uh, in Jammu and Kashmir or the rest of India. Have we forgotten the parliamentary attack? Have we forgotten, uh, you know, other bomb blasts that used to happen so frequently in New Delhi, in Varanasi, in Mumbai, in Rajasthan, in Ajmer, in Jaipur, in many other places? It's only last few years, maybe over a decade or less than a decade, that bomb blasts have stopped. And, you know, major terror attacks haven't happened apart from a few like Pulwama and others. And that too, Jammu and Kashmir, where, you know, unfortunately it is expected. And, you know, a, a little beyond India, you know, I'll go because, you know, you'll understand what happens. Last year in January, I went on a fellowship of the U.S. State Department and I went to Washington, D.C. and Iowa. And it was a joint India-Pakistan uh, event, very interesting event where the U.S. Embassy actually chose me uh, on some re- recommendation that I don't know. But the U.S. Embassy finally uh, called me and said that, you know, we have a request that, you know, there's a Pakistani, uh, uh, you know, uh, group also coming with you. You'll be staying together for a few days. So please, you know, be peaceful. I said, you know, oh, oh, do I look like, look like a terrorist or something? I mean, obviously I'll be peaceful and, you know, uh, I'm a journalist. What will I do? I mean, they said, no, 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 don't take us wrong. We're just generally saying that, you know, when India and Pakistan are there, of course, there is friction and there's a, I said, yeah, don't worry. They said, no, we are extra worried because you're also a Kashmiri. So, you know, you should be uh, out of all the politics. I said, don't worry, nothing will happen. And more interestingly, because they were parliamentarians from there. Uh, the, I mean, three of them. And uh, so for all the days that we spent in Washington, D.C. and Iowa, we had a great time. Very, uh, and it was, maybe it was an understanding also that Issues like terrorism in Kashmir will not come up. We had not said it, but it was like an understanding that we don't have to So we had a great time. We had great food. I mean, obviously, every time we used to go there, 
and we used to be homesick. I used to find a good Indian or a Pakistani restaurant. I used to take them there, and you know, all of us used to have a good time. One thing I that, but I noticed uh, is that every time they made, met a U.S. lawmaker, or they perhaps visited Iowa Assembly, or in D.C. they visited some lobby, they used to come out and make a video. Now I had never, you know, I'm not. I, uh, I don't have such a personality where I just snoop on them. What are you doing? What are you recording? What is happening? But it such happened that one of the lady parliamentarians there was recording a video outside the IOS assembly because we got a standing ovation there. And outside she came and she recorded a video. So I heard it was a two-minute video where she said that today we came to the IOS assembly. Today we met the IOS assembly. वहां के सेक्रेटरी ऑफ स्टेट से मिले और वहां पर हमने कश्मीर में जो तशद हो रहा है वो उठाया हमने कश्मीर के लिए आजादी मांगी हमने बोला कि ह्यूमन राइट्स वर्कर्स और अमेरिका इसमें बहुत बड़ा काम कर सकता है भारत जो है बहुत तशद कर रहा है वहां पर लोगों को मार रहा है ये कर रहा है वो कर रहा है because you know if it would have still happened if they had raised i would have been still okay bhai pakistani hai propaganda kar rahe hain koi baat nahi but they never raised kashmir issue with anybody <laughs> you know, i was present in each and every meeting mm-hmm. and kashmir never came up in any conversation mm-hmm. terrorism also never came up in any conversation mm-hmm. but every time they went out they recorded this video uploaded this video on social media and they got millions of likes and you know love hearts from people you are our representatives you are the reality etc etc this has happened in india also mm-hmm. you know people are bluffing uh, like to the galleries playing to the galleries yeah. and of course if you're getting money for it yeah. then why not why not so i have been in touch with uh, you know security agencies etc who say that this uh, you know if the human rights groups work in an unbiased fashion which is okay you question the government etc but when you are linked with some anti national groups when you are linked with some groups just like the pfi and others mm-hmm. and uh, of course in kashmir also with huria and others uh, we know Gautam Navalkar of the world, Arundhati Roy of the world used to openly support the Huriyat conference. I mean, you remember Abhinav in 2010, there was a conference in LTG Auditorium uh, said "Azadi the only way," yeah. and who was presiding and who was the chief guest? Sayyid Rishi Gilani and Arundhati Roy. Yeah. Yeah. Sushil Pandit filed a case against it, and P. Chidambaram said, "We will not file FIR." It, it, I mean, if you go to Google, you'll see, see it. Yeah, yeah. This I, has I, happened over years. I, I was not there, but you know, Gilani came to JNU once, and ABVP made sure that. no uh, there was lots of protest and he never came came back and uh, i don't know why i came to jnu once i did not attend that meeting she was speaking on naxals and kashmir ka azad din what not someone in the uh, meeting uh, stood up and asked a simple question if you're saying if these people are so weak they are so poor he was talking about the naxals then how come they have the weapons which are much more sophisticated than the security forces i don't know what roy said you are young and you are an idiot that's the answer but he tried to say something all the dsu people uh, the new avatar of dsu is pinjaratur so uh, uh, you know dsu people started haranguing him through him out of the conference room so this is what happens in these conferences which talk a lot about freedom academic freedom freedom of thought but my final question uh, aditya when the article 370 was diluted it is not officially abrogated if i'm not wrong but it has been yeah. rendered toothless in the international media there was no point of view no article which presented the picture other than that of the kashmiri separatists true why do you think that is the case not even any article written on kashmir they will not even present the token official statement of the government of india one sided propaganda as if some genocide is happening in kashmir as if the world has simply crashed or something why do you think what why is what what is the interest of these international media houses in propagating a certain line i see it both ways of now i see it earlier also in uh, messaging and communication uh, because you know if you had tried enough and then failed i would have said ki bhai chaliye aapne koshish ki itni achhi nahi hua wo to propaganda hi kar rahe hain then i would have said okay but if you have not tried uh, you know communication and messaging enough uh, then certainly our problem is also there and when i say our it is the government of india secondly of course there is a lot of propaganda that had happened from new york times from al jazeera from bbc and others continuously reporting such kind of a rhetoric one is because 
conflict cells you know the conflict is an in industry in jammu and kashmir there are stringers you know the local media is mostly of stringers in srinagar and adjoining areas every stringer gets a huge amount of money for every story that is sold uh, or you know given to international wires etc you will see uh, no other part of india but only in kashmir where every foreign organization has a stringer or a reporter or some arrangement with a journalist be it a photographer be it a video journalist or a reporter now if peace returns to kashmir what will these conflict reporters do this is what has happened secondly of course a lot of uh, these journalists have gone abroad to germany to us to uk and of course in conferences met people uh, you know converse with their editors etc and almost you know brainwash them to an extent that you know in kashmir uh, only kashmiri muslims have been suffering india has been torturing them but the reality has not been given so i feel that this is happening for years together we have not even recognized this problem you know we have woken up pretty late so if we are still in deep slumber god help us so my final conclusion here is that the government of india really needs to work on its communication and messaging you know a bit internally or externally and also intra communication within ministries because you know one i example because i give my guest lectures at internal security academy of india of the mha and i tell them because i have to be devil's advocate i have to tell them where they go wrong so i say bala court was an excellent step that you took you know it was a paradigm shift in india's security power and uh, on pakistan policy but immediately of course abhinandan uh, happened the badgam crash happened and things changed but for almost more than 24 hours the government of india was silent they did not even know what to say there was no spokesperson that came out in media and asif gafur became a hero overnight all across and you did not even recognize that problem so while on jammu and kashmir you had excellent policy uh, as i say always on security of course you cancelled amarnath yatra you shifted all the tourists out you ensured no killings will happen no stone building etc politically you handled it very well uh diplomatically you handled it very well but communication and messaging is something that the government of india really needs to worry about because again 2024 is again also coming you know you will do a lot of uh, uh, positive steps such like abrogation of uh, uh, 370 of course ram mandir has happened uh, triple talaq uh, again has happened but uh, then it has to be followed by good messaging and good messaging means if there are positive steps for the betterment of the society that have been taken you not only explain it to your own people but explain it to the world as well or else then you have to become china and you know like china you have to decide either it is a state media or you just don't give a damn you just don't care let them abuse let them criticize you don't worry about you you just go ahead with your policy when well, if india becomes like china what will happen to the academic freedom freedom of expression dissent critical thinking which Imagine really that. means a homogenous propaganda of lashkar e taiba but anyways <laughs> adit thanks a lot for your time it was wonderful talking to you and this is a problem we need to take seriously because i have seen the state of humanities is rotten is rotten to the core in india something has to be done about it i don't know what maybe i think the government should start defunding the institutions which are ask, arguing for the balkanization of india i think that's the that's the least the government can do because you can't control thoughts but at least you can't do that in the state funded uh you know degrees or something but thanks a lot again absolutely the system is supreme abhinav and uh, i believe of course you know ideologies need to be respected difference of opinion needs to be respected but when it comes to sovereignty security of india and you can't just you know go again and again abusing that but thank you so much it was a pleasure as always with you thank you and thank you audience for listening to us please subscribe to the channel and also join as a member if you want to support the channel thank you and see you soon